very much. Good evening, everybody. If I can call the meeting to order. Uh, good evening to people who may be following us online, and welcome to members of the public who have joined us in the meeting this evening. Uh, I'm Councillor Ian Edwards, Leader of the Council, and I am Chairman of Cabinet. Um, we're not expecting fire alarm this evening. If one does sound, we will be leaving the building, and there are many people around you that are familiar with the emergency exit, so we will escort members of the public out. Um, I could, um, if I can ask everybody to make sure their mobile devices are turned to silent so that the meeting isn't disturbed. And um, we will uh, get straight into business, please. Uh, agenda item one, apologies for absence. Mark. Thank you. We have apologies from absence from Councillor Bianco, Councillor Goddard. Thank you. Item two, declarations of interest. Are there any additional declarations for the meeting this evening, colleagues? None indicated. Thank you. Item three is to approve the minutes of the last Cabinet meeting that are on pages 1 to, 20, 1 to 26. Are they agreed? Thank you. Item four. This is to confirm that there are items in both parts of the meeting. Part one, which is the public part of the meeting, and part two, which is private, but we have provided a preview report, item 11, of those matters that will be discussed in private. The reason they are in private is because they are largely contractual issues and it is in the public interest that those sorts of matters are not discussed in the public domain. Uh, there will be a break between parts one and parts two when we close off the YouTube link and we ask members of the public to retire from the meeting. So we're now going to move into part one of the meeting and agenda item five which is the Council's Budget Medium Term Financial Forecast 2024-2025, which ordinarily Councillor Goddard would um, introduce, but unfortunately he is uh, not, not well this evening, and so he has provided me with the script that he would have read, and I will read this into the record. This item deals with the financial budget for the upcoming financial year 2024-2025 and also provides a medium-term financial forecast for the five-year period ending 2028-29. It is set out on pages 1 to 124 of Pack B. This will be submitted for residents and select committees to consider and provide their comments. Let me begin by saying this has not been an easy budget to put together. We remain in a challenging economic environment with inflation persisting at higher rates than predicted by the Bank of England a year ago. And this has triggered increased interest rates, imposing pressures on the finances of families, businesses and local authorities alike. We continue to see increased demand for our services, particularly in the areas of social care, housing and homelessness. Furthermore, and perhaps most significantly, national government funding to local authorities is not keeping pace with inflation. As a point of emphasis, I must remind colleagues that the Provisional Local Government Finance Settlement for 2024-2025 has yet to be received, and therefore there is inevitable uncertainty as to the precise position on business rates and government grant fundings for next year. Faced with this economic environment, it has been necessary to apply a 2.99% increase in core council tax plus 2% increase in social care precept for 24-25. However, I must emphasise that this still leaves us with one of the very lowest rates of council tax in London. Fees and charges are tracking the Con Consumer Prices Index and hence have incurred a 5% increase. This increase will prove to be modest in comparison with neighbouring authorities and will leave us at the bottom quartile in terms of fees and charges per resident in London. Inflation will add £7 million, £17 million pounds to the authorities cost based in 2024-25. Demand led growth will grow our costs by a further £10.5 million. The major contributive factors being adult social care at £3.2 million, homelessness prevention at £2.4 million, special educational needs transport at £1.9 million and waste at £1.7 million. 
This forecast only includes government grant funding and business rates income of which we have absolute certainty. In particular, funding of adult social care amounting to around £5 million per annum relating to the fair cost of care is assumed not to continue in 2025-2026 and beyond. And this, in particular, is the root cause of the provisional budget gaps which appear in later years. I am aware that many local authorities have anticipated continuance of this funding. We will need to wait for the arrival of the provisional settlement in order to clarify this point. A forward-looking and innovative savings program comprising greater use of technology, investor-save measures and service transformation will yield £33.4 million of savings across the five-year term. We have a substantial capital expenditure budget of £217.8 million across the five-year term, all of which will be achieved with modest and affordable levels of external debt. Our forecast makes provision for the strengthening of earmarked reserves amounting to £7.5 million across the next five years. All this will leave us with a balanced budget for next year, 2024-25, with every prospect that we would be able to balance the later years of the forecast in due course. With regards to the housing revenue account, Rents of seven will be increased by 7.7% according to the government CPI plus 1% uh, as of the September 2023 rate. Capital expenditure of 441.8 million is planned across the five-year term. The 2024-25 budget will require diligence and hard work in order to realize the full value of the savings program. However, it is a robust budget based on the realism of the current environment for local authorities, and I therefore commend it to my colleagues. I therefore move recommendations one to five as set out on page two of the order paper. Colleagues, are those recommendations agreed? Thank you. Agenda item six, the dynamic purchasing system for alternative provision, education and send, Councillor O'Brien. Uh, Thank you, Leader, and uh, this evening I am proposing Agenda Item 6, as you have just mentioned, the dynamic purchasing system for the provision of alternative provision for children and young people in Hillingdon. The proposal is to establish a dynamic purchasing system, which is a flexible system that allows um, bids to go in at at any time during the course of the the, the term, allowing officers to create and maintain an approved pool of alternative provision providers to ensure market availability and the best value to meet the needs of the children in the borough that require um, alternative provision. The needs of most of our children and young people can be met through the mainstream education uh, system, but a small proportion with the most complex needs requires specialist uh, support, um, enabling them to progress in their learning, going on to their next steps towards a settled adulthood. Alternative provision and the the young people that need to use this service can be for a a number of reasons. Um, For some, it could be permanently excluded children from their school, um, other children and young people may have a medical or mental health needs that prevents them from attending a regular mainstream school. Um, also, children and young people at risk of suspension or fixed period suspension times, and others are just unable to cope with a full time curriculum. It's a very small proportion of our children within Hillingdon, but um, we do have to make this provision. Um, so, this flexible dynamic purchasing system will create a competitive environment for suppliers and ongoing insurances on value value for money whilst ensuring a breadth of provision that will be able and available to meet the best needs of a diverse and fluid cohort of children and young people within our borough. The recommendations are on page 28. Uh, there are three recommendations and that, the, that I would ask the Cabinet to approve tonight. Um, I can uh, read them out. The one is to approve the implementation of the dynamic purchasing system for alternative provision. 
um, for seven for next for the next seven years to commence in 2024. Uh, the second recommendation is to note the delegated authority to officers to appro approve education placements at any re relevant establishments under the new DPS system. And thirdly, to instruct officers to provide regular monitoring of such expenditure to myself at this moment in time um, in pursuit of the Council's objectives for children and young people. I therefore move. Thank you very much, Councillor O'Brien. Colleagues, the three recommendations agreed. Thank you. Agenda item seven, local flood risk management strategy. <coughs> Councillor Lavery. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, the report begins on page 35 and contains uh, two recommendations. One is to approve the local flood risk management strategy for publication and consultation and also to approve a six-week consultation. We are a local lead flood authority um, and as such we are required to have a strategy. The current strategy was given a six-year time frame uh, to reflect the, peer, the period required for the parent national flood strategy and is now due for view based on that time frame. Um, however, the statutory requirement is to have a local strategy to be maintained um, and therefore going forward we will have a living document um, which is um, published and set out on our website but one that we will be able to make uh, smaller changes to as time goes as opposed to having to do one large review. Um, I therefore um, request that Cabinet approves the two recommendations on page 36. Colleagues, those two recommendations agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Gender item 8, Carer Strategy Update. Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Lisa. The report before Cabinet tonight highlights the work being done by Council and its partners to support those residents with caring responsibilities. Many of our residents, including children, do an unpaid job of looking after relatives and or friends in addition to their own situation, their lives. Data obtained from the Department of Health and Social Care and the Care Quality Commission survey showed Hillingdon had the highest proportion of adult carers who found it easy to find support out of all the eight London northwest boroughs, which is something this borough should be proud of. To highlight some good practice, many children are carers and new information packs were developed by the Carers Trust and shared with schools. Four schools have achieved Young Carers in Schools Bronze Award with a further six recently submitting accreditation paperwork. Work between the Carers Trust and MIND resulted in support groups for bereaved carers including a bespoke counselling service. Hillingdon Hospital now facilitates the carer to stay with the cared for person and therefore have a very important voice in their care. Adult carers of adults are routinely identified by adult and social care through the assessment of need process and offered a carer's assessment. In 2022-23, 3,960 carers' assessments were offered to 2,733 people, but nearly 76% of those were refused. I will come to that just a bit later. Carers have been supported by short breaks, replacement care, psychotherapeutic support, outreach events, dementia cafes, and assisted to obtain extra income. These are just some highlights contained in this comprehensive excellent delivery plan. And I'll use the word excellent again because excellent progress has been made. Also before us is the draft 2023-28 Joint Carer st Strategy. The Health and Wellbeing Board, which I jointly chair, has endorsed its support of this draft and has suggested consideration to be given to do further work to understand why so many carers decline to have a carer's assessment. Thanks also to the Health and Social Care Committee for their scrutiny, and they also suggest further work be done as to why carers decline this assessment. Thanks to both the Board and the Committee members for their feedback, it will be pursued. So I'll be asking to note the recommendations on page 41, 
the delivery plan activity for 2023 and provide any feedback and delegate authority to the Cabinet Member for Health and Social Care and the Cabinet Member for Children and Families and Education to agree the final strategy after consultation. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much, Councillor Palmer. We are so dependent and grateful for the work of the carers that do to support our residents, um, and they need our help. And I am very pleased that we have this strategy that drives the support that these carers need, and I thank you for your work in taking this forward and also the work of the officers. Are the two recommendations agreed? Thank you. Agenda item nine, parking enforcement policy. Councillor Lavery. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, the report beginning on page 99 has two recommendations. One is to make some changes to the observation times before a penalty charge notice is issued as per Appendix 1, and also to agree to implement the enforcement of vehicle drive away and prevented from issuing penalty notice charges permitted under the Traffic Act 2004 as amended. Uh, background to this report, um, we have reviewed the uh, observation periods um, for various of the traffic offences. Um, five minutes was, was the standard. We are dropping um, for a lot of things. Uh, there are some that are set at naught because, that is, um, because they're always absolute offences. Um, and we're adjusting a number of others to three minutes. The particular one that we have not adjusted is the one in residence uh, parking zones um, where visitors may require just a little bit more time than three minutes to get to somebody's door and make sure that they, they, they have been recorded. Um, we're also taking the opportunity to introduce something we've not done before. At the moment, a penalty charge notice has to be affixed to a vehicle um, for it to be valid uh, and we do have issues particularly in some parts of the borough where drivers park and see the attendant and then and then will drive away um, so um, it won't be perfect because we've still got to do the observation period but it will give us uh, more ability to enforce um, those offences because we don't have to physically uh, pin it on the car and if the driver takes action to avoid it being put on the car we can issue it by post so that will it will tighten up enforcement and and will be a useful tool um, to us in some locations more than others but it will be a useful addition to the powers that we have I therefore request that the two recommendations are approved thank you very much Councillor Lavery yeah, for me it's important that we do tighten up this enforcement uh, but at the moment there's an expectation of five minutes. Will th there be a public awareness um, publicity campaign prior to this taking effect? Thank you, Leader. Yes, there will. Thank you very much. Colleagues, are those two recommendations agreed? Thank you. Agenda item 10 is the Council Budget uh, Month 9 Budgeting Monitoring Report. And again, I will read into, into the record Councillor uh, Goddard's report. This report, which is set out on pages 111 to 138 of Pack A, deals with the Council's projected results for the financial year to the 31st of March 2024, as they stood at the 31st of October 2023, that is month seven of the financial year. The financial environment for local authorities continues to be challenging. Flat levels of central government grant funding contrasting with legacy inflation and increasing demand for key statutory services lies at the heart of these <coughs> difficulties. Hillingdon's response to the financial challenges faced is realistic and robust. We manage our costs by using budgetary controls and we will maintain our levels of debt at modest and sustainable levels. We remain resilient in our response to financial pressures. The general fund revenue account continues to indicate a small underspent of £2,000 against budget. This is consistent with the month six position. As previously reported, the exceptional cost of the staff pay settlement, together with the planned use of earmarked reserves for items such as the 
continuing legacy COVID pressures, core inflation and the older person's discount, the projected 2023-24 year-end position on earmark reserves is £13.9 million. In addition to this, we also have unallocated general balances amounting to £26.8 million. So in total, we continue to project £41 million of reserves at our disposal at the end of the 2023-24 financial year. As I, have said earlier, as I have said in earlier reports, it is our objective to retain and build our reserves notwithstanding the continuing challenging economic environment. Colleagues will recall the comments that I made earlier in this meeting about measures included within the medium-term financial forecasts, which when realised will strengthen our reserves. Our existing programme of savings for 23-24 is unchanged from the previous position reported in that we will achieve our entire target of £22.8 million, albeit there may prove to be delays in the delivery of items amounting to £242,000. General fund capital expenditure for the financial year is now indicating that the previously reported underspend within the year will be reduced from £38.4 million to £29 million as a result of a favourable cost variable variance amounting to £9.4 million. Work has now concluded investigating placement costs within the high needs block of the dedicated schools grant and this has indicated that the deficit will increase to a projected £26.5 million at the 31st of March 2024. The housing revenue account continues to project a full year outturn which is identical to budget albeit that inflationary pressures on costs have been absorbed against a favourable position on debt financing. The housing revenue account capital expenditure for the year continues to be projected at £83.9 million as reported in month 6. I therefore move recommendation 1 of the report as set out on page 112 of the pack. Page 134 sets out 10 financially orientated recommendations itemised A to J. A particular note are the recommendations A to F, which propose the acceptance of various strands of grant funding. All other recommendations are self-explanatory, and that, therefore I move recommendations, recommendations A to J. Colleagues, are these two sets of recommendations agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item 11 is a public preview of matters to be considered in private. This is a report that we provide to give members of the public more information on the matters that will now be considered in part two. That brings part one of the meeting to a close, so I would ask the link to be broken and for members of the public to retire. Thank you very much.